presenter. Um, as they're getting ready, is Kane Umayer, is an autistic attorney who has a number of other disabilities, including ectodermal dysplasia and a cleft lip and palate. Shane is also a survivor of coercive treatment. This background has led Shane to be involved in disability justice advocacy for the past seven years. During that time, Shane has worked with a number of organizations, including, including other statewide protection and advocacy agencies self-advocacy organization and a law firm with a focus on addressing and preventing abuse and neglect in institutional settings. So here we have Shane. Um, the, uh, for instance, to say 
that yes, you can have this treatment, but only if you do this thing. That uh, only if you are this kind of person can you accept or refuse treatment. Uh, and thank you, by the way, Olivia, for um, uh, gender queering the slides. I won't see many of the slides because that's incorrect, but for handling the size of the slides in any case. So um, I'm going to talk about some of the underlying ideas here. This is the more theoretical aspect of things. I will get into concrete examples. But some of the underlying ideas here that justify it is that, um, and there's a missing part of this first one. Um, so the idea is that uh, that normal, the idea of what's typical, is the same as beautiful, is the same as healthy. And the missing part is that it's all considered mandatory, that you must be all three of them and that they are the same. A secondary part is that deviance from this normal must be punished. If you aren't that, if you fail to meet that mandatory requirement, you are in some cases deserving of punishment if it's seen as a moral transgression or failing on your part. In many cases, this overlaps with the idea that the other is dangerous, the other being some scary um, a person that we can separate from other people like us and that we must contain and or punish to reduce the threat to all of us, meaning the normal people. And I, I recognize you here that oh, all of us here may not fit into the all of us I'm talking about, but as a wide societal idea, the idea is that the other must be separated and um, sterilized, contained from the rest of us, being a society definitely believes we comprise of normal people. Uh, next one. Um, uh, there's also some ideas of that are framed as being more benevolent, or at least what people think is benevolent. People who will say, oh, if I was like that, or if I was like you, I wouldn't want to live with that. And so therefore, the logical step in the mind of some people is to take the life away from somebody who they wouldn't want to be like. It, it is seen by the people making these decisions that is benevolent, but um, it's often done without the consent of the person who has learned to live that way. Um, I'm going to reverse this here. Another thing, and this justifies a lot of the more benevolent forms that so people think of coercion, is that a lot of people don't know what's for their own good. Some, often it's because of legal minor status or guardianship status. Well, of course this person is incompetent. Somebody else needs to decide. decide for them, and not just about a few things they're bad at, but about everything. Um, and if they don't like it, well, it hurts me more than it hurts you, and you'll thank me for it later, if you ever can. And you might not be able to, because obviously you can't understand what's going on. Um, and finally, there's this idea that society can't change. Like, sure, yeah, we don't like certain things, but hey, that's how it goes. We can't force people to be nice. We can't force the, the world to change. So we have to do these things to make people fit in, to contain a threat, um, et cetera, et cetera. Because discrimination is going to exist. We can't fight it. And um, it's the best solution available. Um, and as you will see later, I distinctly object to that. And I hope everybody here does as well and decides to work off that rejection. Thanks. Um, a few more kind of grounding things, foundations. What I'm talking about here as far as care is a number of things. Uh, it can be as routine as just a primary care visit, and yes, there are people who face medical co coercion in the, name, in the area that we're talking about there, such as denial of care because somebody does not fit an idea of um, the doctor's idea of deserving of care. People will talk about trans elbow syndrome of if you have an elbow problem and you're trans, they'll attribute it to that and they won't focus on your actual need. Same applies to fat people and I use the word fat and not obese because that's what the advocacy community has used and they see the word obese as pathologizing so that is my terminology there. But uh, um, the thing that you often hear there is fat people coming in for a doctor for an ear infection and they say, well, have you thought of weight loss? And uh, so in that case, you can be denied care, even in a routine um, checkup. And this brings 
can go from that to surgery to people who are intersex again, people who are neither um, to whose um, external genitalia are neither male nor female. The doctor will decide from birth, well, this needs to be fixed. So before someone can even determine their gender identity, the doctors decide for them based on often what's easier for the doctor to create based on what he, she, or they sees. Um, I would hope that no doctor who identifies with they, as they would do that, but people can be shits. Um, so, um, I, in the interest of time, I will not go into examples of everyone and ex instead stick to some of the examples here. Um, one of the, the things that I really focus on, and this is always the risk for me of I can get bogged down in this section here and never stop, is compliance based behavioral interventions. Uh, my area of, uh, of study slash advocacy is in the overlap between compliance behavior intervention and institutionalization in the area of the troubled teen industry. Uh, you might have read news stories about boot camps or wilderness programs or boarding schools that take troubled teens, whatever that means, people ranging from kids who actually attack other kids to kids who have sex before their parents think they should have sex to kids who are depressed and doing that in school to even things like kids who are um, trauma survivors or people whose parents have just recently passed away and they're grieving. The, the troubled teen industry will see any problem, regardless of cause, and advertise for kids to be sent off to these programs uh, where they will be, uh, where um, they'll be subjected to any number of techniques that, if you look at the history, um, is even of the troubled teen industry, come directly from sources such as cults and um, thought reform, um, thought reform methods in countries like um, Korea and China. Uh, and this sounds like conspiracy theory, but if you look at the person who founded the program that, and that led to every other troubled teen program, Charles Dederick, who started the cult called Synanon, um, he was looking at the research regarding brainwashing. And somebody took the model of Synanon which included that long-term confrontation and confession sessions between, at one point, um, voluntary members of the community uh, who started this, but later coercive, using sleep deprivation, long-term being locked in the same room with a bunch of people, fighting it out, uh, food deprivation, sleep deprivation, all of these have been taken from what was at one point voluntary adult participants and taken to institutionalized youth, who often aren't believed, who are shut away, who are isolated from their communities, all to cure them of something that doesn't necessarily need to be cured or do so in a way that will make things worse. Now this is a, um, I would say at the continuum, this and the JRC, which Rydia always talked about, and it's using shock therapy, I use that word in quotation for anybody who can't see me moving, um, those are kind of the far end of horrible and, far, and down the line it are programs used in every day. Sorry? The car can't hear you. Um, so the little one microphone, you can hold it. This? Sorry. Um, uh, there are behavior. <laughs> on students with disabilities, um, autistic students especially, um, in special education and even mainstream classrooms. I'm referring to applied behavioral analysis, which the beginnings, the origins are depicted here with um, Ira Lovis, the founder of this program, shouting into a kid's face for some misbehavior. Now, ABA doesn't look like that today generally. I say generally because there are abusive practitioners who are outright abusive rather than subtle coercion, which a lot of people excuse. In fact, a lot of what's called ABA is actual occupational therapy or speech therapy, but ABA gets insurance coverage. But that doesn't mean that 
ADA doesn't rely on um, coercion tactics, and it doesn't have as its aim normalization of the people who, uh, who uh, are participating or forced to participate. For instance, one form that's particularly egregious is feeding therapy, where a therapist will try to make a student, usually who has sensory sensitivities, eat a food that their body doesn't see as food. They see it as eating something that's going to make them sick, and it will. Um, and it will, uh, one particularly egregious story was how a young person, uh, an autistic person, was made to eat a food they had an aversion to, and when they grew up, as expected, they were left to sit in their own throw up as a punishment. Um, affection uh, can be withdrawn from somebody who doesn't comply with this or another behavior program with a young child will say, okay, mommy's going to leave you here if you don't comply with the program or uh, for kids, uh, autistic kids across the age, um, age range, sorry, um, they, uh, they'll, be, uh, they'll have their interests held hostage. Oh, uh, well, let me frame it. Autistic people will often have very strong passions, some, sometimes called special interests, sometimes called obsessions or perseverations in the more pathologizing language, where something will matter to them. It's all that uh, all somebody wants to talk about is what they think day in and day out. And to have a therapist say, before you have access to your dinosaur plushie, if dinosaurs are your special interest, before you can talk about trains at all today, you have to do this, that, and the other, concentrated, focused, complying, or you don't get access to that thing. Um, so that's, again, I can get bogged down in this. But there are some examples of behavior modification. Uh, and the, uh, one last one I will mention is conversion therapy, which actually shares its origins with ABA in, in that the same research was involved. But this is, uh, it's widely condemned more increasingly now um, the use of conversion therapy to make um, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender people, um, etc., attracted to um, the same sex or gender conforming. Uh, it doesn't work. Um, it's still used, they're still legal in most states, um, but increasingly it's being rejected. For instance, the psychological field, the field now rejects it. However, it's not rejected as used on disabled people to make them seem like disabled. Uh, for psychiatry, is, no, sorry. Uh, for psychiatry is another example of making somebody uh, take medications they want to take, that they don't want to take, putting somebody through electro, uh, electroconvulsive therapy, which is not continuing electric shock, that's different from what happens at the JRC, but it, it can nonetheless be forced on people, and given that it is a pretty heavy duty procedure, it involves inducing a seizure and can result in memory loss. It's nothing to sniff at it and when it's forced on somebody, especially in an institutional context. Um, and uh, contingent access to treatment, you see this especially in the area of um, fat people, of people, uh, for instance, in, in Great Britain, there was recently a study that said 50% of healthcare practitioners believe that it should be the right of doctors to refuse care to patients they view as overweight. Um, and also in Britain, they were taking measures to enact a law that would allow um, the loss of welfare benefits to people who didn't lose weight, which would affect any number of things, um, housing, ability to feed oneself, etc. So there's this, uh, there's this idea that if you are a certain kind of person, you don't deserve care, or to, or in order to have access to other things in your life, autonomy, housing, etc., you must accept care that you don't want for care, as the case may be. Thanks. Um, involuntary surgery. I already mentioned intersex surgery a couple of times, um, but I would also like to point you to this, to this image about cochlear implants. Um, very strongly rejected within the deaf cultural community. Um, again, it's done on young people, um, generally under the age of three. Um, the very being, being that it takes that it takes better when it's done on a very young person. And 
Uh, it kicks out whatever hearing aids is. Um, much like blindness, deafness but is all often not in complete absence of hearing, but some low level. It takes out the hearing that exists and it puts in a machine that hears, um, but in a very different quality from how most people hear. And a lot of people do not get the position in whether they, they uh, to have this or not. As a result, um, uh, young people have a different experience of hearing than they might have, and it changes their access to deaf culture and identity. Um, I have this comment here about the from the deaf community about the difference between a child who does not have one and a happy member of the deaf community and a child who does, who fits in nowhere. Um, how much time do I have? All right, I'm going to skip the rest of it and I will be happy to talk about this with you um, later. And this can have a range of bad effects. Often it minimizes somebody's trust in the medical profession. Somebody who has been forced to care or who has been denied care because of who they are, especially by a doctor, will not trust um, providers to work in their best interest, work with them rather than on them. And this will damage their health over time. It can also cause long-term trauma or other um, mental health concerns, depression and anxiety, for instance. And if somebody is put through things done to their body, to their brain, without their consent, um, and this can lead even to depression or suicide. One last thing I want to mention is more helplessness, especially in the context of behavior modification, where somebody is punished. No matter what, uh, uh, um, their decisions are, uh, uh, their access to everything is made contingent on behavior. They go this way, it's not okay, they get punished. They go this way, um, and eventually they lose decision making ability. There's people who have said that in the aftermath of behavior modification um, programs, they have been able, unable to set boundaries. They have been unable to distinguish between healthy relationships where it's not about control, it's about consent because they were told in uh, settings that were closed off, institutional settings, that they could not say no. Um, so uh, how do we change this? Um, I love this photograph about maximizing autonomy with this woman saying no. Ironically, it came from something that, uh, uh, something saying, why don't people accept interventions? But I love this idea of setting boundaries that care that you don't want. Uh, Um, it takes, it, it'll take a social recognition of the right to and from care for everybody, um, to whatever degree is possible, that somebody should be able to decide what happens to their brain, what happens to their body. To as part of this, reject compliance, reject compliance with uh, treatment, you'll often hear about people being treated non-compliant, rejecting compliance with a norm that's imposed on them that has nothing to do with their, or even society's well-being. Uh, and to create alternatives, uh, there's often uh, what I found a, a lack of alternatives between um, or a, a gap between the options of no care and forced care. This idea of you can't have autonomy and support. If you're having a crisis, you have to check yourself into a psych hospital, an emergency room. You can't go somewhere and get the treatment you need when you need it and then leave when you're done. You have to hand over your autonomy as well. Creating those intermediate alternatives will go a long way. Places you can go, get instant uh, counseling medication, and then come back uh, when you're not in a crisis point. And to center the patient, center what they want and what they need. Um, hi. Oh, hi. Um, it'll also take changing the framework in which we see people and. Um, see their needs conform with a norm. Um, I love this picture. It says, why it's not diet. It's the idea that you should protest the, um, the societal act, it, uh, insistence on weight loss as, and saying this as the ideal, challenge that through riots, through actively questioning and fighting against that. And that's exactly what you, we should do. We shouldn't still stigmatize in, in another one instead of saying, oh, well, what can you do? We should say, all bodies are violent, let's make the world where that can happen. Um, make make um, 
normalcy value neutral and distinguish health and beauty from normalcy. And from there, um, make the changes needed so that none of this can happen and all of us are valid. Um, thank you for bearing with me and for um, my especially technical ineptitude. And if we have time for questions, that'd be great. like to get lunch underway. Um, we do have time, but unfortunately it will have to be one very quick question. I do have a question for you. First of all, I want to thank you um, for your presentation. I felt it was beneficial for me. Um, I work in a group home and I don't know if there's any programs that or any group homes that you can recommend that fit your vision, you know, of, of good programming solutions for people who are, who are serviced in those environments. Um, so, um, I want to uh, repeat the question here. Um, what are your programs? Um, she, her, uh, she was telling me she works. She, in, she. She was telling me she works in a group home, um, and she appreciated my presentation. Um, and she wanted to know if there are any programs I would recommend um, that that work off this vision. Um, I. My idea, I can't recommend any specific programs. Uh, what I would hope to see is a uh, is service provider who the supports and programs they provide pass what I recently heard called the burrito test. The burrito test is in the space that you're living, with the supports you're getting, can you walk downstairs or across your hall, uh, roll there, or however you get to the kitchen, Make yourself a burrito at 3 in the morning and eat it without staff telling you you can't, without interference. Do you have that autonomy? If, and I heard that if you cannot do that, you're in an institution. An institution being an overly restricted place. So I encourage you in your role to encourage, uh, to um, strive to and encourage others to strive to passing the burrito test and making the place where you work a home and not an institution. Thank you so much.